it's Rebecca at Time Smith Dressmaking. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're chatting about books about 18th century dress. Whether you're a beginner and struggling to tell quickly whether a style is an 18th century style or Victorian or Elizabethan Tudor, how can you recognize 18th century? Or you've been making your own historical dress for decades. I'm going to look at a selection of books that I've roughly classified according to their purpose, what they can do for you, no matter what stage of this journey, how much knowledge or skill or none at all that you may have. First of all, I have several books to share that feature visuals that give you a chronological information as to the main styles of dress in the 18th century, what they look like so that you can recognize them and with help in breaking down um, the sequence, uh, the changes over time. Even within the 18th century, there was a lot of change and there was actually a lot of variety. There were more styles being worn at any given time than perhaps we think of. So these books are also the pretty pictures, uh, but you're learning as you're looking at things too. The second category of books is what I call kind of the essays. They're written by historians to help you understand the context of the clothing. So they're heavier on text, but usually some very good pictures as well, but give you a broader a broader uh, sense of the, the meaning behind the clothing that you're looking at. And the third category I'm going to look at has to do with patterns on fabrics. Uh, what motifs and colors and combinations, how do you recognize what is a period appropriate print? So first up, looking at visuals, I'm going to start with a book that just came out fairly recently called How to Read a Dress by Lydia Edwards and there will be a link in the description below. This is a chronological look at uh, changing fashion from the 16th to the 20th century, so it gives you a nice feeling of where 18th century fits into things, what came before and what came after. A typical page will show you um, an extant from a museum um, with information as to what it is, what style, what it was called, um, the year or year range, was was decade period it came from, and what museum um, it's in. So we have this fantastic Mantua, early 18th century in the V&A, little pointers to different features and tell you what they were and what was key about that time period, how you know that this was typical, or maybe not, but the key, zero in on some of the details that help differentiate that gown from the 1720s from this gown, from about 70, 80 years, 70 years later. So this is a really fantastic book. And even those who know a lot about changing fashions and what were characteristics of certain time periods, it's still a really fascinating book. And it's very well rounded too, with references to you know art um, depictions too of similar styles and just pulls the whole thing together in a really easy to digest, but really fascinating on the details too. So this book, really like that one. And then I've got a couple of books by uh, art historian Eileen Ribeiro, uh, looking at the visuals, the paintings and drawings um, that happen to uh, be of people wearing fashions. So it's looking at what can we learn about the fashions of the period as they were painted by contemporaries at the time. Uh, some of those uh, motivations for art um, may not have been to record exactly what people were wearing or what we're seeing. And some artists would drape their clients uh, in costume um, to to project certain themes or certain values of that time period. And then other times people come and say, I want to be painted in this as my best to show off my wealth. All sorts of motivations is all sorts of nuances you have to think about with art history in terms of what is what you're seeing actually a reflection of what were people wearing but it can be a very useful guide to shapes and silhouettes and, and recognizing, um, recognizing 18th century dress and getting some history behind um, uh, key players, um, people, um, both their subjects, the sitters and uh, the painters. So this book uh, by Eileen Ribeiro, A Visual History of Costume. I have another one by the same author, same art historian, um, that is a little bit more... Um, theoretical on um, the themes and um, that we see in, in historical dress through the 18th century by means of portraits. It is a study of portraits. So it is looking at the meaning of dress, um, historical themes, the ideas of um, your uh, the image that you portray versus the reality, uh, 
heroism. Um, there was there were certain themes through history that marked how people wanted to be painted and how painters approached that the relationships between painters and sitters. So that's that's kind of um, very heavy on the pretty pictures, but also uh, very important scholarship on art history, a uh, dress that we can learn from art history. The second category of books is uh, that I want to talk about is the broader historical context. So starting with an oldie but goodie, Dress in 18th Century England by Anne Buck. Now Anne Buck was the curator of the costume collection in Manchester. Uh, her title for 25 years, I love this, she was called the Keeper of the Costume. And this book came out around the same time I was born. So it's getting up there, but there's so much in here that still holds up and is still good scholarship. Back in my legal days, we talk about, is it old, but is it still good law? Can you count on it? One of the fantastic things I really appreciate about this book is that she breaks things down, categorizes things according to class or social standing, people's station in life, and that and looks at their interactions with each other and with the social strata above and below. So people um, going to balls or uh, birthday parties, for example, or masquerades and looking at each other, you know, and noting and writing about what they saw their, um, their contemporaries wearing. So there's a lot of uh, primary source documentation in this book, but from a gives you almost a little gossipy sense because it's about, you know, real people observing other people. And she has the chapters then according to kind of social status, starting with crown and court, royalty, uh, people of fashion, um, the gentry, servants, the common people, and a really useful chapter on buying and making clothes, how people sourced uh, goods that people weren't just at home making their own, but there were a, a very speciality trades uh, and secondhand markets and even ready-made uh, clothing being made. Um, a section on fabrics and wearers and dress and society. It's that broader scope, that broader uh, picture that this book is, I think, very good at laying, setting out the scene and giving a good grounding as to what English society and the relationship people had with the dress. But I just want to flag up a couple of things just from the introduction, the very beginning, the set the scene that I think is really valuable. And one of those is distinguishing fashion from dress, the fashion had to do with change and sequence. That you looked at something that was brand new, you'd never seen before, and you knew what had come before, and then you'd be watching with keen interest. And that's what fashion historians looking back. It's that changing sequence, that parade of change of changing fashions that defines what fashion is. Whereas dress, and as a dress historian, this is dear to my heart. Dress has to do with people's interactions with fashion, what is available to them, what they could do, what they could buy, what they could wear, and their choices. What did they actually wear? And that's where there's so much variety and agency and choice. And it's not just about, oh, I can get that, but I will get that. And then I will adapt it for me and express personal taste. That's where all the variation is. And the relationship between fashion and dress, it's intrinsic, but it's tangled and complex. And I think this book is very effective at untangling that and helping you appreciate the difference between fashion and dress and how these play out in human society, and how people interact with each of those. And my next book that is broader context, really help you understand society, how it worked and the role that clothing played is this one. I think this is an essential. No matter where you are and your level of interest in 18th century dress, The Dress of the People by John Stiles. This focuses on primary documentation, primary sources in more than north of England, but outside of London, which is very valuable. So it's ordinary people, what they were wearing, what clothing meant to them, what they need, what they needed it to do, the function, where they got it, changes in materials, lots of incredibly just fascinating um, pictures, uh, paintings, um, caricatures, cartoons, 
And it's worth noting that uh, John Stiles, the other work that he's done, I'll get it into my next category on fabrics, um, that he's got an incredible knowledge of people's eye for it, uh, the aesthetics. No matter what your, your station in life, there are certain things that had to do with kind of your pride and your dignity that clothing is important to you for. So that's an important book. Before I move into just talking specifically about fabrics, um, I just flag up one book that kind of verges into making a construction, but it's, it's Costume and Detail by Nancy Bradfield, where she took line drawings, made line drawings with construction notes of lots and lots and lots of garments in the Snows Hill collection. Some of this goes in rotation on, on display at Barrington Hall, which is a National Trust property. Miss Brad Bradfield uh, made incredibly detailed drawings that this is, this is very useful re reference when you're constructing garments, but equally it's just, it's nice to sit and look at the pictures and just say it's one of those books that you can sit down with after dinner in a comfortable chair and, um, and your favorite beverage and enjoy. And normally when I make a top five essential books list, uh, for me, my purpose being to make, um, my top five would be very heavy on the how to make and construct front, but this book is always included. I, it crosses barriers, that book, and I think it's quite unique. The last category I'd like to look at is how do you know if the fabric you're looking at is appropriate? for 18th century. We tend to say train your eye, look at lots of extants, look at lots of examples, and there are lots and lots of gowns in museums, in collections that you can look at online. Those are the intact gowns, but they're not the full picture. And there's also things like survivor bias. So we tend to see a lot of garments that um, have survived because they belong to wealthy people. But what about ordinary people like you and me, if we reenact or do living history and we're portraying a more ordinary sort, whether we want to call it working class or middle class, um, how do we know what fabrics, I mean, you can just go the safe way and just do nothing but solids, right? And you just have a solid colored wool or solid colored linen. When we look at things today, we're often seeing patterns printed on cottons that are made to mimic the appearance of silk to mass, of woven silks and it's so tempting to try to get the look of a silk in a cotton because it's often cheaper of course. I'd like to refer you to some books that contain uh, images, clear depictions of textile remnants that so we have primary sources to see what these fabrics actually look like and these are cottons generally, generally. So the first one up is Threads of Feeling, and it's by John Stiles, who also wrote Dress of the People. Threads of Feeling is a feature of tokens that were left at the Foundling Hospital in London by families or mothers who could not, for whatever reason, keep their child or their baby, their infant, and they would leave their child with the Foundling Hospital. And often they would have some sort of fabric remnant, a token pinned on their on their swaddling cloths, on their on their wrappings in some way, with the with the practice being that the mother would have retained a piece of that same fabric. So that if her circumstances changed, if something enabled her to come back and claim her child, that she'd have this token that matched the child's token. And that's what this book is, is a collection of those tokens called Threads of Feeling. And it is, it's heartbreaking, that context. But to look at the examples of the fabrics that were left gives you an idea of printed cottons. Most of them were indeed printed cottons in the time period that, that uh, tokens were being left at the Foundling Museum. It's sort of 1750, 1790, that sort of period. So a lot of 1760s, and it can be quite surprising. Um, some of the prints that to our eye might seem quite modern, um, but lots and lots of prints, and you can get a feel for the colors 
um, bearing in mind that some of them may have faded or had a degrada degradation um, in the colors that are being depicted, but uh, the outlines, the motifs, the scale, um, some of them can be quite uh, realistic and others quite abstract. This is a wonderful, wonderful, it's quite slim. Uh, again, with all the other books, I will try to include links to all of these um, in the description below so that you can find them. And the last one is a big book. <laughs> this is the published um, publication collection of the album that Miss Barbara Johnson kept that served as a bit of a household diary as a record of her own good housekeeping and management for money. She had a, a, a set income, a limited income, and yet due to marriages within her family, her younger brothers um, tended to marry into society. So she had social obligations and appearances she needed to make. She needed to look smart. So she was making her money go, spending it as wise as she could, maximum bang for the buck. And she kept fabric snippets and would record how much of this fabric she got, how much she paid for it, and what it was intended to be made up to. She did not just buy a stash and sit on it because fabric was expensive, it was valuable. So she would indicate what it was, what she'd bought it for in mind. Um, and there's, there's lots of context to um, the introduction is written by uh, Natalie Rothstein of the v &A Museum, who's um, looked into the context and some of these things that could be identified as to what party or ball or or a social event that Miss Johnson wore some of these things too and could be um, but again sometimes the samples are quite surprising and can be linked to sample books from weaving houses um, things things like silks uh, so Miss Johnson wore she had the full full gamut of of silks uh, wool, cotton, and linen, and and given her circumstances in life, she really made a, the made good use of the cottons. So this album starts, I think, in the 1750s when she was quite young. So it does actually record. There are a few things that are on the cusp of her that are really her childhood before she um, moved into adult fashions. Uh, there are floral prints of both cottons and linens. There are. Collections, this page has got a bit of um, uh, knotted fringe, or what we sometimes call fly fringe, just little samples of that. It's a remarkable book. Um, up until recently, this was quite hard to get a hold of um, and expensive when you did. And then the VNA, they have the original, the original journal. They've digitized quite a lot of it. It can be very hard to look at on a phone or a mobile device, so you kind of need to go to a desktop to go into the the v &A online, the museum digital collection, and search for um, the Barbara Johnson album, um, where you, if you're on a desktop, you can, you can, but it's not, not all of the samples are there, and it can be hard to search. It is kind of a page by page trawling through. Um, I happened to find this book at a fairly decent price just before the v &A announced that the digital uh, collection was then available on their website, which I might not have bought the book if I'd known that was about to happen. But I refer to this book on a regular basis, and I'm really glad to have it. So that's Barbara Johnson, her album of fashion and fab fashions and fabrics of her lifetime. And she did leave, live um, into the Regency um, the period and um, was keen to be presentable um, and up to fashion. She was not uh, an old woman insisting on, you know, clinging to the styles of her youth. Um, she did keep up to date. And her terminology is interesting always to read, too, as to what the different gown styles that she referred to that she had in her wardrobe. So that's a little peek back. Um, a slice of time, a real woman and her real clothing, her real wardrobe and her buying habits, her tastes, what she liked, what she could get and what she spent her limited funds on. So this has been a bit of a whirlwind trip through, I think, some highlights of my bookshelf. I'm always bookmarking and uh, saving on the internet links to books that I would like to read or acquire. And so my collection, my, my library, so my library is always growing. If there's anything that you wonder if I've run across a book on any particular subject, 
um, can try to help you out. So let me know. But again, if you have any comments, any of these books, any more information about how to find them um, or what they contain, I can certainly let you know what's in the table of contents and in the indexing so that you know whether the book is worth borrowing from your library or trying to get a copy uh, or even pooling with friends. If you've got a little costuming group, um, see if you can put together a group library where you're all pooling your, re your resources as something that you can all share and benefit from. So I hope that's been interesting. So next week, I'm going to talk about patterns and that includes books with patterns in them, including gridded patterns and patterns that can be graded up, uh, also ones with, with shapes in the period um, style. So we'll look at those next week. I have lots on those. I could I could talk for hours and do several different episodes, <laughs> several videos just on those. So take care and we'll see you next week.